obviously we're skipping over a lot of important stuff. By the time you get to chapter 8, I told you we were going to move by the flood so quick, through the flood so quickly that we weren't even going to get wet. So when you get to chapter 8, verse 18, it says that Noah went out and his sons and his wife were with him. Now he tests the suitability of the world uh, in a very clever way. He sends out a raven, he sends out an unclean bird, he sends out a dove, a clean bird. I believe that when the Lord Jesus Christ is baptized in Matthew chapter 3, that when he comes out of the water and the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove, I believe this is an echo of what happened in Genesis 8. I believe that the Holy Spirit found a clean man, a pure man, where the Holy Spirit could live on and in, and that person was Jesus of Nazareth. And the dove sent out from the ark is finding a place for a clean bird, even as the world has been purified in waters of judgment. After Noah comes out of the ark, chapter 8, verse 20, he begins to worship. There's a new world and there's new worship. Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. Noah built an ark to the Lord and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. Now look at verse 21. This in a way is another anthropomorphism. Writing of God as if he's a man. But look at this. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma, that is, of the sacrifice. And the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing on the earth. But I want to say something about verse 21. We have five senses. We have seeing, and we have hearing, and we have tasting, and we have touching, and we have smelling. You know, you can um, observe tremendous variations in what people believe is good to look at. Sometimes we see a very attractive woman with a, very, with a man who's not very attractive and we say, what does she see in him? Or we see a very attractive man with a very unattractive woman and we say, what does he see in her? These are very carnal judgments. We have a saying, you probably have the same saying too, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. You may like a certain kind of food. I love the country of Korea. Their Christianity is probably the most faithful and the most powerful in the world today. I hate their food. They cannot live without a certain fermented cabbage called kimchi. They love it. It's their rice, like the Chinese. What rice is for the Chinese, kimchi is for the Korean. What hamburger is for the American, kimchi is to the Korean. I hate it. It's awful. They love it. There may be certain ki kinds of music. An old person, a classically trained person would think that's noise, that's awful. A young person would keep it in his ear all day long and couldn't live without it. This is true. In, in all the senses, but not smell, not smell. You can't talk somebody into thinking a, a bad smell is a good smell. A smell is either a good smell or it's a terrible smell. Certain kinds of smell, let's leave food out of it, okay? Certain kinds of smells. And there is a certain kind of worship. There's a certain kind of prayer there's a certain kind of obedience which is fragrant and wonderful and good and beautiful in the nose, in the nostrils of the Lord. In English, this is the nose. These two holes are the nostrils. Verse 21 
talks about these, the aroma from the worship was a good thing in the nostrils, in the nose of the Lord. He accepted that worship. He um, makes a covenant with Noah in chapter 9 and with his sons, and, and they are to fill the earth. We see the uh, end of vegetarianism. We see the beginning of capital punishment in chapter 9, verse 9, as, Noah, as God establishes a covenant with Noah in verse 9. Um, something happens, and by the way, uh, there's a sign of the covenant with Noah in verse 16. It's a rainbow. Now here's the question. Was there a rainbow before the flood? The short answer is, I don't know. It could be that it didn't really rain before the flood, so there wouldn't have been a rainbow in the sky if it didn't rain. It could be that the, the refraction of water before the flood did not cause a prism of color. It could be that that property was given to water and light after the flood by God as a sign of His covenant. I don't know. All I know is that after the flood, the rainbow began to be a sign of God's covenant with Noah, that He was not going to destroy the earth again by water. There's a, 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 a black African-American spiritual called The Fire Next Time. There's actually a book called The Fire Next Time. And what the song is about is that when God judges the earth again, He won't judge it by water. He'll judge it by fire. Now, let me just say that there are many critics in the world who believe that these things are made up, who believe these are fables. Again, fables like how the fox got his tail. And it, it's that a person would have to be very naive, very childish, or very superstitious to believe these stories. Let me say that they're not fables. And let me also say that there's a strong, strong proof in chapter 9 that the story is not made up. And this kind of proof repeats itself in the book of Genesis. And this kind of proof repeat, repeats itself throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. We see the amazing words in Genesis 9, 18 and 19 that the sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem and Ham and Japheth and Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated." Now, critics who do not believe the Bible insist that the Old Testament is full of made-up stories, and they actually offer us reasons why the stories were made up. The stories were made up by the priests, they say, to help inspire faith. The stories give us great models of heroes of the faith, faithful men that we can look to and we can be impressed with and that we can try to become like those men and those women. Well, there's only one problem with that theory, and that is um, the Bible tells us not only the good things about those men, but the bad things about those men. We're going to see that in the life of Abraham. We're going to see that in the life of Isaac. We're going to see that in the life of Jacob. We're going to see that in the life of Judah in Genesis 38. Notice what it says in verse 20, Genesis 9, 20. Noah began farming and planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and became drunk and uncovered himself inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers." Now, this doesn't merely mean that Noah's son saw him without any clothes on. This happens all the time among men. It means something worse. 
it means that something happened. Something happened that involved physical contact. Something happened that was shameful and unspeakable. Something happened that was hard to talk about. And here's the question. Why is this reported? It's reported for the same reason the flood is reported. It's reported for the same reason the miracles are reported. It's reported because it's true. It's reported because it really happened. You see the fearless honesty of the Bible, the amazing honesty. We're going to talk about this much more in chapter 12 and in chapter 20, where Abram in chapter 12 and Abraham in chapter 20 commits a terrible sin against his wife. Terrible. And it's the same sin at different times in his walk and at different times in his maturity as a believer. But we are told about this terrible thing and then we see another curse. Um, he essentially, when Noah wakes up and, and realizes what happens, he curses the children of Ham and he blesses the uh, children of Shem and says that Canaan will be a, um, a servant to Shem. Now here's the question. Does this mean that the different races who descended from these different sons will always abide under a curse or a blessing? Well, the book of Galatians says that in Christ there's no male or female. There's no Jew or Gentile. All curses are removed when we trust Christ. All blessings are gained when we trust Christ. These things really happened. These things are really true. But the coming of the Son of Man really changes things. Now in chapter 10, we see one of the great genealogies of the Old Testament. Uh, we have long lists. We have the family of Japheth. We have the family of Ham, and we have the family of, of Shem. And we don't need to, to pay too much attention to, to chapter 10. We can keep going. If you're interested in genealogies, there are books written on these, these things. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com.